Okay, good. So what I'm going to do today is, I'm a, more of a basic scientist than Steve. I'm going to talk about an, uh, a cell type that might prove very effective as a platform for CAR therapy. It's called natural killer T cells. And um, we've been working with these cells for many years. And the work in, uh, at our institute was uh, done mostly by Isaac Engel and uh, by uh, Greg Somwa and uh, Vijay, or Pandurangan Vijayanand. And also, I'll talk about some work uh, by my collaborator, uh, Leonid Metalitsa. So uh, there, there are what I consider to be four systems of antigen recognition by T cells. Um, most of your T cells recognize peptides presented by polymorphic HLA molecules. But there are lipid reactive T cells. And there's also um, a T cell system that may be up to 10% of your total that recognize riboflavin metabolites that are made by microbes. And those are called mate cells. So uh, among the lipid reactive T cells are NK T cells. And uh, NK T cells are a bit like NK cells in the sense that they kill very rapidly. CD8 cells also kill, of course. But normally, you have to differentiate them over a period of days. Well, these two cell types, which have a lot of similarities and are often confused, in fact, have immediate killing activity. The difference here is that these are bona fide T cells. They go through the thymus. They rearrange antigen receptor genes, while these uh, natural killer cells don't do that. But other than that, they express the same kind of surface receptors. They respond to cytokines. These cells also are distinguished by the great variety of cytokines that they can make. And so they actually combine features of natural killer cells, which are a, a truly innate lymphocyte, and of T cells. Um, so what are these cells? They have an invariant alpha chain. We have this wonderful system to generate diversity of antigen receptors. And all these cells, their T cell receptors are similar. One of the chains is, in fact, identical. Uh, they recognize lipid antigens presented by CD1. And they carry out these very rapid innate-like responses, make a lot of cytokines. And one thing I, I need to tell you is that in a mouse, uh, these cells are very abundant. But in people, it's a little bit different. So in a flow cytometry of peripheral blood, these are NK cells. They don't have CD3, which is a marker for the T cell antigen receptor. And these are cells that are, are true T cells that also have NK receptors. But among this rather large population, only a small percent are these uh, lipid reactive cells that I'm going to talk about today, which we detect with CD1D tetramers. So this is not necessarily a very big population in, in people. Um, so the antigens that are, that are recognized by these cells are glycosphingolipids. And I won't go into uh, much detail. But this one was found by Kieran Pharma, which is a partner of our institute. And it came from a marine sponge. Um, but one very unusual property of these cells is the conservation of their specificity. So if we consider that glycosphingolipid antigen I just showed you, mouse NKT cells recognize it when presented by mouse CD1. Human cell NKT cells recognize the same antigen presented by human CD1. And there's even interspecies cross-reactivity. So the specificity of these cells has been conserved for 60 to 80 million years since we diverged from rodents. Any one of my uh, influenza peptide plus HLA reactive T cells wouldn't, wouldn't work in any of you because of HLA polymorphism. But CD1D is not polymorphic. So these cells can work across histocompatibility barriers. Are they relevant for human disease? Um, they're relevant for almost any mouse immune response that's been studied, almost any inflammatory response in a mouse. It's more difficult, of course, to show that they're relevant in, in humans. But one thing I will point out is that uh, this is a positive prognostic factor in neuroblastomas. If you have more of these cells infiltrating the lesion, uh, that's a positive factor. <clears throat> so these cells can be uh, activated in different ways. I've already told you they can be activated purely by cytokines. However, they have an antigen receptor, and they can be activated by microbial antigens as, uh, by microbial antigens as well as by, probably by self-antigens. So they have a degree of self-reactivity. <clears throat> One of the very puzzling things about them is uh, the variability in their frequency. I've already told you they tend to be less frequent in the peripheral blood of humans than in mice, but there's variability. This is our own normal uh, donor pool at the La Jolla Institute. Some people look like this. They're mouse-like people, if you will. But most of us, not just in terms of this uh, parameter, uh, but most of us, I believe, they're anonymous, so I really don't know. Uh, but most, most of us are like this. However, 
If you look in other sites, we looked in the peritoneal cavity in patients undergoing peritoneal dialysis, and Lydia Lynch uh, looked in the omentum, which is a fatty tissue. In humans, these cells tend to be uh, more abundant, so maybe an average of around 10% of the T cells in fatty tissue, a couple percent in the peritoneal fluid are these cells. By the way, this is highly genetically determined. So in identical twins and other studies, this seems to be mostly a, a genetic phenomenon. So uh, can we envision an, uh, a therapy based on these cells? And a lot of groups are trying. One is to use the lipid antigens as adjuvants for cancer immune therapy or for vaccines for malaria, for example. Um, people are thinking about using just expanded cells for, uh, as an immune therapy for cancer or other diseases or as a platform for expression of chimeric antigen receptors. I love left off the word receptors, or, or CARs, and I'll, I'll come back to some themes that Steve Foreman told you about earlier. And this is just to tell you that there are companies that are trying uh, to develop these cells either for cancer uh, or for even inflammatory diseases if one uh, gives the lipid antigen in different contexts, and I won't go any, into any more detail about that. So um, I'm just going to talk about, um, I've already told you all of this. Uh, but I want to emphasize this uh, clear parallel. So when we study these cells in mice, we think they're very similar in humans, and, uh, and CD1D is not polymorphic, so uh, expanded NKT cells will not cause any allo reactions, any graft versus host reactions, and could conceivably uh, be used across donors, or at least the same antigens could be used for different donors. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about how these cells respond to microbes. I'm going to talk a little bit about subsets of these cells, and then I'll talk about um, um, the chimeric antigen receptor work. So these cells are very protective in mice uh, for strep pneumonia. This is a mouse that doesn't have NKT cells because it can't form the invariant rearrangement. It dies, and it has about 100,000 more, uh, about five logs more bacteria in the lung by day three, as Ho Jose Luis showed. And these cells get activated very, very rapidly within about 13 hours after infection. The, um, we've gated on the NKT cells here, and there are ones making gamma, and there are ones making IL-17. There are separate populations, by the way, in the lung right, uh, very soon after infection. We just take the cells out and do intracellular cytokine staining. So we, working with chemists, we've purified the antigens. This is an antigen from uh, strep pneumonia. This is one from Borrelia burgdorferi. They're glycosylated diacylglycerols. The antigen I showed you earlier is a different kind of lipid. Uh, Borrelia burgdorferi, by the way, is, causes Lyme disease. It's the most common vector-borne disease in the United States right now. That's until global warming gives us all dengue in a few years. But, um, but nevertheless, we've worked with structural biologists, and this shows you here is the original marine sponge antigen. Uh, this is from an environmental bacteria, and these are the two pathogens. These are structures of CD1D bound to these glycolipids. You're looking down at it as if you were a T cell receptor, and they look rather different. But somehow, when the T cell receptor binds, you get this enormous accommodation, and everything ends up looking rather similar, which I find kind of interesting. So let me tell you a little bit about subsets of these cells. So this is, for immunologists, this is a very familiar diagram. And what it's telling us about CD4 T cells is that some of them make IL-4, some of them make gamma interferon, some of them make IL-17, and there are signature transcription factors that drive this. So for NKT cells, we know that there are similar populations, and NKT2 is a homolog, if you will, of a TH2. It makes IL-4 and uh, IL-13. And we want to understand how do these subsets arise because all these cells essentially have the same specificity, how is it that they partition into these different subsets? It's not a question I'll answer today, but I, what I can show you is that we've sorted them based on surface markers so that we take surface markers, go in the thymus, sort the tetramer-positive cells that are 1s, 2s, and 17s, and you can see, for example, the 1s uh, he, here in green have a lot of Tbet, but very little RR gamma T. The 17s have, have the opposite little T-bed, but a lot of RR gamma T. And for, for aficionados of uh, T cell biology, this is what you would expect. A cell that makes IL-17 is going to have a lot of RR gamma T. And these are actually RNA-seq tracts, so when we sequence these separated populations, we can see the 1s make gamma, the 2s and 17s don't, the 2s make IL-4. The 17s, the NKT-17s make a little bit of transcript, but this is down here, this is H3K27 acetylation. The chromatin is at least poised uh, for expressing IL-17. 
The shocking thing about this is that even though these cells have the same receptor, and they're in the thymus, so they're, they haven't been stimulated, they have greatly different gene programs. They're different by literally hundreds of genes. Um, and this is a PCA, this is an MA plot, and this is the PCA here. And um, I think the population that's most interesting for cancer is the NKT1 cells, which are most like natural killer cells. So I can say here, these, the NKT1s are the killers. This just shows they express many genes differently. They have fast ligand, which is a killing molecule. They express all these NK receptors, the NKT2s and the NKT17s don't. Uh, so they have a lot of cytotoxic function. <clears throat> this is uh, a single cell. We did a single cell analysis, which I won't go into the detail, but it basically shows the same thing. This is an unsupervised clustering. Each bar here is a single cell, and the NKT1s have a lot of NK receptors. <clears throat> and uh, basically, um, in the interest of time, a more single cell analysis, but basically the NKT1s are the killers. The other thing that's interesting about it is they have different chemokine receptors and different integrants. So the NKT1s have CXCR3, the 2s have CCR4, and the 17s have CCR6, which means uh, that they tend to go to different places in the body, and we already know that that's the case. And this is just this, this is the bulk RNA-seq, this is the single-cell RNA-seq down here. And again, I don't want to go into all the technical details. So this is Leonid Mitsalitsa, who I've worked with for many years, and I'm, uh, he's at Texas Children's Hospital, and I want to present some of his work. Uh, and, uh, he and I are, are talking and collaborating, and, and this is, but this, I want to stress this is really his work. And he believes that um, these NKT cells are really uh, great, um, are going to be great as a car platform for certain kinds of tumors. So I already mentioned his work saying that um, those people who have INKT cells present uh, have a better outcome in uh, neuroblastoma. Um, so based on that, he wanted to develop a, a car, an NKT cell platform uh, for cars to uh, attack a neuroblastoma. So uh, Steve has already introduced chimeric antigen receptors. They're often single-chain antibodies attached uh, through the membrane to a spacer. And the antigen here is ganglioside GD2, which is a, a glycosphingolipid. It doesn't activate NKT cells, but it's an antigen highly expressed by neuroblastoma and by some other tumors. And antibodies to GD2 have shown some benefit in treatment. And uh, then there's a lot of engineering of these things that goes on, and I think Steve's talk already alluded to that. So there are different, they all have this uh, uh, outside of the cell, this GD2 specificity, but inside of the cell they have different domains here. And I'll tell you uh, that this one turned out to be the most effective one. So it has, uh, it has a little bit of zeta, it has a little bit of CD28 and 41BB, which uh, seems to be the magic sauce here, as I'll, as I'll tell you. So, uh, uh, NKT cells, I told you, they, they're very rare in a lot of people, but we can expand them up very dramatically, uh, many thousand-fold within a couple of weeks, even from patients that have very few in the blood. And if you, uh, and the average expansion that he got was 5,700-fold uh, over 21 days. Um, and what he found is that uh, these, these cells, these that exp NKT cells that express this CAR, can kill GD2 positive targets, that's shown here. But because they still have their antigen receptor, they can also uh, kill uh, CD1D positive macrophages, and that's shown here. And at least in his uh, humanized mouse model, and he has evidence in humans, in this case, the tumor associated macrophages are a bad actor. So you get a double benefit here. The GD2 is going to allow the cell to kill the tumor, and the CD1D specificity is going to allow it to kill the TAMs that are in the tumor. Uh, and here he's showing you that, um, that the infiltration of these cells into the tumor, this is obviously immunohistochemistry, without the CAR, T cells and NKT cells, and then with the CAR. So the CAR actually enhances the ability of these cells to be maintained uh, in the tumor, and that's quantitated here. Uh, and the NKT cells do better uh, than, than the conventional T cells. And the reason is, again, that these are kind of natural effectors, and they, have, they seem to have the machinery that allows them to go to tissues. Um, so here's a, 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 a figure showing the, basically the therapeutic efficiency of these cells. So the tumor uh, is labeled with bioluminescence, and you can see the tumor, uh, the tumor is growing. And then if you give CARs, you eventually, you can, you can affect the tumor growth, but by week five, the tumor actually comes back. If you give this optimal CAR, this is the one that had the three pieces in the intracytoplasmic domain, this optimal CAR, 
um, gives the best, uh, best protection out at least to week 10. But eventually, uh, actually, eventually the animals uh, don't survive. And uh, a lot of things happen, so the PD-1 expression goes up and the cells become inactivated. So the point I want to make is that cars alone in most cases probably won't work long term and there's, pro there's going to be other things that we have that are probably going to be needed. And that's a theme that, um, that Steve already mentioned. But the other interesting thing about it is, uh, one, of, one of the things we're thinking about is, are there ways that we can uh, uh, selectively expand the NKT1-like cells, the ones that are going to have cytolytic activity? And actually, this, uh, having this 41BB uh, piece in the cytoplasmic domain seems to do that very well. So if you look at um, different NKT cars that have different cytoplasmic domains, they all have the GD2. If you have this 41BB piece, you get more gamma interferon and you get more GMCSF produced, but uh, there's, less, there's less IL-10 compared to some of these other cytoplasmic domains, and IL-4 is not very much affected. So this is the profile you want, and it's something that I think we want to think about um, making, the, making it even more effective. Um, the other interesting thing is that, at least in his system, and what he's using here, I should stress, this is all in a humanized mouse. So this is in a nod skid mouse that's given the human tumor, that's given the human cars, and that's also given human hematopoietic cells. Sorry I didn't <laughs> mention that earlier. But what, what, he did, what he does find, and, and the clinical trials are, are supposed to start next year on this, but what he does find is that um, if you give CAR and KT cells, you're less likely to have a graft versus host disease because your, your T cells, even if you give them a CAR, they have all these other specificities so that uh, in this case, it's a xeno reaction. It's a human T cell that's reacting to mouse tissues. So you get this mononuclear infiltration in the lung and I don't know how well you can see it, but are also around here in the liver and it's much diminished when you give the CAR and KT cells. So just to summarize what I've told you, uh, NK T cells are a, a population of T cells that recognize lipid antigens. Um, the lipid antigens that we know very well are from microbes. There are also self antigens that are still poorly defined. Um, but when uh, they do give protection from pathogenic uh, uh, microbes and they're important, at least in a mouse model, for host protection. This is something we're also looking into in humans that have pneumococcal pneumonia. Um, so, Although these cells look, all look the same in terms of specificity, they somehow partition into different subsets that differ for transcription factors, molecules involved in homing, inhibitory receptors that regulate their autoreactivity, and effector molecules. And this happens in the thymus. And the NKT1s are perhaps the most important for cancer. They're most similar to NK cells. But um, according to, uh, to the work Leonid's done, they also persist longer than NK cells. Um, so they may be a useful platform for cars, they expand easily, they have cytotoxic function, they can home to and persist in tissues, and they can be induced to produce interferon gamma and GMCSF, depending on the type of construct, with this intracytoplasmic domain being important, and they will not cause graft versus host disease, because everybody, we all have the same CD1D molecule. So I'll stop there, and I'll be happy to take any questions you might have. Just picking up on the Borrelia uh, kind of offhand comment, I know it's slightly tangential to your talk, but in, and there are the genetic differences in the INKT cells. Are those people protected from Lyme disease or that's never yeah. been investigated? If, well, they have, if they have an enrichment of that cell type. Right, so we just, you know, we tried to do this years ago to study patients uh, that, had, had, that had recently been infected with Borrelia and we, didn't, we just didn't have access to many patients. And now we've just started up again uh, the, so in a very preliminary study, it looked like the Lyme disease patients had very energic and very few NKT cells. Um, but we're just, N, N equals three, and that's not enough, of course. So we're just starting up the study again. Uh, I've never, you know, usually, the, usually we can just work with normal blood or whatever, but here we have to wait for the ticks to bite, and it has to, the, the samples have to come from the northeast. But, so I've arranged it now with Adirondack Health System. So I'm looking forward to, we're going to try to test that. Okay, anything else? Um, okay, saturation or confusion? Okay, so it's my, uh, 
pleasure to introduce the, my colleague, who's the third and last speaker in, in this session. It's uh, Dr. Steve Schoenberger. He's been um, a leader in the field of studying CD8 T cells for many years, uh, CD8 memory, and their interactions with other immune cells, including CD4 cells. And very recently, he's uh, made an enormous push to develop therapeutic vaccines for cancer. Uh, and I believe that's what he's going to talk to you about today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mitch.